time for being with you and your, you know, with your family. So I'm, I'm really thankful that you made the time. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, perfect. Let me know. Can you see the slides? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you uh, about the title of my talk is Cosmic Alchemy in the Era of Gravitational Wave Astronomy. And I'm going to sort of give you a flavor of sort of what we have learned so far uh, in really trying to understand the systems, uh, particularly neutron star mergers. And you know, I just want to highlight that, of course, a lot of the work that I'm be talking about has been in collaboration with uh, wonderful grad students and postdocs. Um, so I really want to acknowledge them. Okay, I'm going to give you an outline of what I'm going to do for you today. So I'll, I'll try to give you a brief overview of nuclear properties and the R process, broadly speaking, so that we all, uh, you know, kind of speak the same language and understand uh, just the salient issues and, and how they basically emanate from our understanding of nuclear theory. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what we know about the R process from high spectroscopic abundance observations in stars and what are the sort of simple arguments that you can make just by looking at the abundance in terms of um, constraints on, on what we call the R process. And of course, I will explain what the R process is. Uh, I'll tell you about neutron star mergers as side of R process nucleosynthesis and, and give you a little bit of an overview of the sort of thinking, of course, before the recent detection about the sort of observational signatures that we were expecting and, and how they uh, may not uh, sort of match the expectations and, and the lessons that we've learned from these amazing discoveries, 1708-17, and which remains so far the the only electromagnetic signatures, you know, associated with a neutron star merger. Okay, so this is, of course, uh, you know, for all astronomers or periodic table. Uh, and there is a huge amount of information that we can learn from the abundance pattern observations of, of, of the sun. So I just want to highlight a few things which are going to become crucial to the discussion that we're going to have today. So the first thing is to uh, locate these close neutron and proton shells, uh, which of course at first sight you immediately see that the abundance peaks correlate with the positions of these close neutron and proton shells. Uh, what you can also see very clearly is that iron, which we know is the most bound nuclei in the universe, has you know, equal numbers, of course, of protons and neutron close shells. And as you go uh, elements that are heavier than iron, you start getting a significantly larger fraction of neutrons compared to protons. Um, where you can go, for example, to lead, uh, as you see there, uh, which is basically doubly magical. These are called the magic numbers uh, in, in both proton and closed neutron shells. And what I'm going to talk to you about is some, some of those peaks uh, that you see uh, that at first sight seem not to be correlated with closed neutron or proton uh, shells, which uh, are intrinsically the R process. And I'll explain you where and how they arise. Uh, something that's important to, to take note is, of course, there's two impediments for charged reactions to make elements heavier than iron. As you know, iron is the most uh, bound nuclei, and therefore you have to give energy to the system. So these are certainly endothermic reactions, but more importantly is actually the increase of the Coulomb barrier as a function of atomic number, which makes it incredibly difficult for the you know, charged reactions to actually give rise to these elements. And almost exclusively, these elements are actually uh, made by neutron capture and, you know, as you know, when you capture a neutron, you become unstable and you beta decay. And then if the time scale of capturing neutrons is slow compared to the beta decay time scale, as I will show, you basically follow very close to the beta stability limit. And that's basically where the S process emanates. So, you know, the S process, you can capture a neutron, take as much time as you want, beta decay, and then capture another neutron. Uh, the R process, on the other hand, you have to capture neutrons much faster than you beta decay. So the capture has to be incredibly fast. And that immediately points out to, of course, time scales and neutron densities. Uh, what I'm going to highlight here is the abundance pattern of the S process and the R process. And we're going to basically focus on the first, second, and third peak. I'll tell you where they arise. And then, as you can see there in the R process, the first, second, and third peaks seem to be shifted to the left. Uh, and I'll explain you why that's the case. Okay. Now, in order to do this, I'm going to explain 
significant amount of time uh, showing you this beautiful plot. Uh, this is from Chris Neen review. The first thing to, to just realize there is if you capture a neutron, uh, I don't think you can see my cursor, but you capture a neutron and then you better decay and then you clearly see the position and the motion uh, across that diagram. Uh, the first thing that I'm highlighting there, highlighting there is the stable nuclei, which are in black. So the S process actually happens you know, very close to that beta stability curves as you basically capture a neutron and beta decay. So it processes very, very close to, to that stable nuclear line. Uh, what it's important to, to realize is that as you move from the stable nuclei downwards, uh, the time scale of the lifetime of these uh, nuclei becomes progressively shorter. Yeah, so these uh, are basically unstable and their lifetime is short. And this is gonna become incredibly important uh, because when you realize, for example, a, a typical R process pathway there with separation energies of a few MeV, you realize that the R process is actually uh, capture really, really far from stability. So when you look at the time scales, you know, you realize that you're now in the order of a few milliseconds or so. And naturally, you know, you come to the conclusion that, you know, you have to basically capture neutrons on that time scale. You know, what are the only, what is the only object that we know in the universe whose dynamical time scale is of order of, you know, tens of milliseconds or so or less, you know, it's a neutron star. And therefore both you know, neutron star mergers or the birth of a neutron star had been highlighted at, you know, essential uh, components for the R process, essential sites. Um, okay, so something that it's incredibly important to realize is these closed neutron shells, which are gonna give rise to the first, second, and third peak in the abundance pattern. These are the so-called magic numbers. Uh, so what happens there? Uh, in order to illustrate this, I'm, I'm showing you here the neutron capture cross sections. Uh, this is on the S process pathway with separation energies of about 25 kilo electron volts. What are the things that you know are immediate there? The first thing that you realize is that odd mass numbers tend to have higher cross sections than even nuclei. And you immediately saw when you look at the abundance pattern of the sun that there was basically the difference between odd and even numbers in the abundance pattern. Now, more dramatic is the substantial lowering of the cross-section near the magic numbers. You can clearly see there at N50 and N82. So what's happening there? Well, of course, these nuclei are stable and they do not want to capture neutrons. Uh, so therefore, the cross-section drastically decreases there. And the way that I kind of envision this is you can imagine that you have a neutron flux. And as soon as you get to one of these magic numbers, there's a stagnation point in the flow. And therefore, the number of neutrons just accumulate there. Um, it's sort of like if you're driving on a highway and then you basically have an accident and the, then what you end up having is just an accumulation of cars at that particular location. So similarly here, you have a neutron flow that ultimately gets stagnated in these closed uh, neutron shells. And as a result, the substantial lowering of the cross section means that you know, the, there's an anti-correlation between the capture cross-sections and the abundances. You know, once you have this substantial lowering of the abundance, you know, you get a substantial abundance peak there. You can also immediately understand why you see these odd mass numbers, you know, tending to have higher cross-sections than even nuclei. And as a result, you know, they are less abundant. Okay, so something that it's very, very important if you're doing, you know, if you basically capture and you're moving along the S process line against the beta equilibrium uh, scale, you will arrive to the first uh, here, the first peak, uh, you continue, you get to the second peak, you continue, you get to the third peak. And what I'm going to do here is just compare the first, second and third peak on the R process because the R process is captured so far from stability, you arrive to the first peak, you arrive to the second peak and you arrive to the third peak, but you do so far from stability and then you beta decay, yeah? So ultimately what you see is that the first peak becomes a projection on that plane into the stable nuclei. And as a result, you know, the first peak shifts to the left, the second peak systematically shifts to the left and so forth, the third peak. So naively, when you look at both the S process and the R process abundance pattern, it seems that the R process doesn't correlate with nuclear structure, but it does. It just so does, you know, far from stability. And by the time you decay, you sort of eradicate it memory of the um, closed shell neutron number, no? But ultimately the pattern just uh, 
naturally arises from nuclear structure. Uh, and as a result, you can clearly see this uh, where you have the first, second, and third peak in the S process in blue, and then you have the first, second, and third peak in the R process, and you see that shift just as these objects, which were basically created far from stability, decay back to stability. Now, another important thing to keep in mind is that a particular nuclei can be actually formed by two, pro you know, by both processes. You know, so that, such is the case, for example, of lead, who, you know, at a few percent level, the R process contribute to its formation. Um, the third peak in the R process is my favorite peak because it has both platinum and gold, and that's almost exclusively made by the R process. So that's why we sometimes in public lectures utilize gold as, as, an, as a crucial component of the R process. Now, I'm highlighting there europium, and the reason why I'm highlighting europium is because europium has an atomic oscillation strength that is actually relatively deep, and therefore uh, it appears as a prominent absorption feature in the you know in in stars and we use europium as a tracer of the R process abundance. Now there's a peak there which is called the rare air peak, which at first sight doesn't seem to correlate with these neutron closed shells. And if you if you're interested in that, you can ask me about how you know what are the sort of theories to build that rare air nuclei. But you can clearly see things that are common to stellar spectroscopy like barium and strontium there which also have you know, incredibly strong oscillation strengths and therefore you know, are very prominent in the spectrum. But these are sort of the things that we have to keep in mind when we try to do you know, sort of an inventory of mass in stars. So, so what do we know about the R process in stars? Uh, if you really like objects that are highly enriched in R process, highly enriched in gold, these should be your favorite star. This is called the Sneeden star. Uh, in, Sort of celebrating Chris Neen, uh, who discovered it, uh, and this object is, you know, relatively high abundance of R process. So what have we learned? So in the past decade or so, uh, what what is shown there is, you know, a broad range of high resolution spectroscopic abundance uh, derived, uh, and what they're compared to is the R process abundance of the sun. And here you're really focusing between the second and third peak, which is referred to as the heavy R process. And what you can see is that the pattern is incredibly robust. Yeah, these are low metallicity stars. They have been shifted in normalization just so that you can see the abundance pattern. And what I will show you is that the total content of our process can vary significantly from star to star, but the relative abundance is extremely robust, particularly of the second and third peak. So you need an a mechanism that basically doesn't depend severely on the initial conditions where you're converging to an abundance pattern that is incredibly robust and that has been operating, you know, for the age of the universe in an incredibly robust manner because these are really low metallicity stars. So this is an example of, of these two stars, this Neden star, uh, which compared to the sun, you know, has almost uh, hundreds or so higher abundance on our process. Uh, something that's incredibly important to realize is that there's significant R process variations, RMS fluctuations between stars in the halo. That means that stars can actually vary by hundreds in the total content of R process. Uh, if you look at a tracer like magnesium, for example, the RMS variations are significantly lower. No? So this is also hinting at this idea that whatever is producing the R process is a rare process. Uh, <clears throat> the sort of analogy that I wanna kind of leave you with, uh, and, I, and I won't talk about R process enrichment in the galaxy evolution content, but you know the, the sort of um, analogy that I want you to think about is if you enrich the Milky Way with a process that is very, very common, but produces very little amount of mass, let's imagine against, uh, you know, you get like a very, very, you know, a, a thin chocolate cookie where the chocolate is actually very, very well spread all over the, the disk of the Milky Way. But if you're using uh, an event that is actually rare and produces a lot of mass, then the chocolate chip cookie analogy comes to mind in which you have regions where are highly enriched and regions where you don't. So the argument is that, you know, something like this Neiman star was formed, you know, from material close to the chocolate chip cookie, while something like HD 12, 2563 was far away. You know? So there's something that you can learn about turbulent mixing in the early universe by looking at the spread of this. And, and if you're interested in that, I can, uh, I can talk more about that. So this is just to illustrate uh, 
the two stars, uh, particularly if you look at the calcium K lines, you know, around 4,000 Armstrong or so, you know, they're very, very similar. Their metallicity, the iron metal abundance of these two stars is rather similar. But if you look at the europium line at about 4130 <laughs> Armstrongs, you can see the difference in depth between this Neden star and non. So here you can immediately see that these two stars have, you know, drastic variations in their gold content, even though the iron abundance is, is rather similar. Another important uh, number that I want you to keep in mind is that if you really want to produce the total amount of mass stored in stars in the Milky Way, you need a production rate of the order of about 10 to the minus 7 solar masses per year of our process. This is for a galaxy that is forming about one solar mass per year. So for every you know, solar mass of material that you form in star formation, about you, know, you need to produce about 10 to the minus 7 solar mass per year of our process. Now, if you multiply that by the age of the universe, which is about 10 to the 10 years, you get about 10 to the four solar masses. So that's more or less what we have. We have about 10,000 solar masses of our process material um, basically in the stars uh, if, you, if you were to do the mass budget of, of our process in the Milky Way. So not surprising, you know, standard core collapse supernova happen about one every 100 years, order of magnitude. So that means that in order for them to be consistent with the R process, they have to produce about 10 to the minus five solar masses, uh, while neutron star mergers rate is of the order of about 10 to the minus five per year per galaxy. So that means that they have to produce about 10 to the minus two solar masses to give rise to that 10 to the minus seven uh, solar masses per year magical number, uh, which, is, which is incredibly important. Okay, so can we derive, a, you know, is there a very simple way that we can derive a, you know, a limit onto how much mass one of these objects has to be, you know, has to produce. And, and the simple calculation that you can do, these, these things are so rare that you can uh, basically assume that stars that are formed uh, in, enriched with our process in the early universe are enriched by one event. So then you can say, well, what's the fastest that I can turn material into stars? Well, you know, once you have either a neutron star merger or a supernovae, which produce about 10 to the 51 ergs of kinetic energy, you know, that material sort of randomized, uh, gets, of course, you know, progressively more isotropic and starts sweeping material. And once you sweep about 10 to the three or so solar masses, you can actually start cooling. So that basically cooling mass gives you, you know, the smallest amount of hydrogen that you can basically, that you need to sweep in order to start cooling, yeah? And then you can say, okay, well, what is the minimum amount of our process material that I can put on that cooling mass? And basically I derive a constraint on what is the mass per event, the minimum mass per event that I need in order to reproduce the abundance pattern that I see in the stars. You know, if I basically dilute uh, through more hydrogen, of course, the content of europium in this particular case will decrease. So you do that with, you know, with the stars and you just simply transform the europium over iron into a mass. And this is basically ultimately what you get, uh, particularly in stars like this Neden star, which has, you know, the highest uh, amount of europium, you get a constraint that you need to produce at least 10 to the minus three solar masses of our process material. Yeah, and that's of course a lower limit. And immediately this argument rolls out standard core collapse supernovae because standard core collapse supernova happen way too frequently. And you know, in order for them to explain the R process, they will have to be producing about 10 to the minus five or so um, solar masses per event. So what this immediately means is if you want to assign it to a core collapse event, then it has to be a rare core collapse event that you know, whose rate is actually relatively infrequent, but it produces a significant amount of mass per event. And you can put a constraint also on the rate by knowing this 10 to the minus seven solar masses per year that you need to. So this is a very kind of simple argument, uh, but elegant. So this suggests that the production of heavy R process elements need to operate robustly and at drastically reduced rate when compared to core collapse supernovae. And this is irrespective of, of what of these two mechanisms is the one that you assign to. And, and there's some discussion as to whether or not neutron star mergers are effective at enriching uh, the early universe because they take some time to merge, but I won't be talking about that. Okay, so how, how neutron stars produce the R process. And here, uh, I'm gonna show you a simulation that I did uh, as part of my 
grad school. So this is, of course, archaic now, but I like the movie. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Newtonian calculation. So I'll show you that the field has drastically uh, moved from the simple calculations. But really what I'm going to show you is basically we're going to follow um, the, the, the tidal tail evolution. So here you get the two objects become dynamically unstable. You get mass shredding in the outer Lagrangian points about 1% of a solar mass of material or so, a little bit less, is actually able to get above the escape velocity in these tidal tails. And the evolution of these tidal tails is much easier to follow because the irradiation from the neutrinos is actually not very prominent. So um, these are sort of um, fairly robust uh, mechanisms to produce the R process, although there's a significant amount of debate as to whether actually they can supply you with enough mass. But of course, you know, the field has drastically transformed uh, since then. And in general, you know, the amount of mass depends, of course, on, you know, the mass ratio, uh, sensitively, the equation of state that you use. But there's broad agreement that you get anywhere between 5 times 10 to the minus 3 to 5 times 10 to the minus 2 solar masses of material. And, you know, with velocities ranging with 10% to 30% the speed of light. And that depends on where the outer Lagrangian points are located, which, again, depends both on the mass ratio and the equations of state. But this is the simplest model for the R process and much, you know, and most robust. So I'll focus on that and I'll tell you a little bit about the challenges. So the first thing to realize is we're going back to these uh, proton-neutron uh, diagram that we talked about. Uh, what I'm showing there at the top left panel, uh, so the red line is the temperature evolution. You're following the tidal debris. Uh, you're following the density evolution and then the heating rate, which basically comes from basically photodissociations, alpha and beta decays and fission reactions that are heating the material. Uh, most important, I, I also show there the time scale. These are calculations uh, led by Luke Roberts, who was a grad student working with me and now working with Jonas Lipponer have, have done the SkyNet network, which is uh, a nuclear network. Uh, the first thing to notice is that at these neutron rich um, composition here, you, you see there the YE or you may not, uh, but it's listed close to the heating rate, which is about 0.1. You have lots and lots of neutrons, but you also in nuclear statistical equilibrium, as you can see there, you also have nuclei available to you so that you can capture those neutrons. No? And that's a huge advantage that we have, particularly in highly, uh, neutron rich material that almost irrespective of the entropy in nuclear statistical equilibrium, you already have those nuclei. So what you're going to see is you're going to see the evolution of the capture as a function of time. You see the stagnation in the first peak, a stagnation in the second peak, a stagnation on the third peak, and then basically the decay back to stability. You know? And you see the abundance pattern being formed there in real time where the first, second, and third peak are highlighted. Now, what is incredibly important is that the decay continues and there's an energy deposition rate. And this is going to become essential because it is this energy deposition rate which ultimately powers the light curve. Yeah. So it's important to keep track of, 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 the, of the heating rate here in particular. And of course, the you know the hope is that you know models like this so to, at least to zero order able to reproduce the R process abundance of the sun. You know, and not not in huge amount of detail, but broadly speaking, they do a relatively good job. And it seems like when the material is actually not highly neutron rich, you're converging to an abundance pattern, at least for the heavy R process that looks rather robust. Okay, so just to give you uh, kind of a feeling of how much mass I picked, you know, my favorite element, which is gold, which is about something like between five six percent of the total mass and you know one of these events produce about a Jupiter mass of gold uh, so a significant amount of our process material this is again the amount of gold storing about a million stars uh, so not surprisingly as we were talking about the amount of uh, mass per event here is incredibly high you know uh, you can if you're interested you can calculate that you know the one gram of gold is about Ten dollars. You can calculate, uh, you know, the, the price of one of these of one of these um, mergers. Okay, so we talked about so these objects basically evolve secularly through gravitational waves. Uh, they take you know hundreds of mega years to giga years to merge. They become dynamically unstable. Uh, 
at least something that is guaranteed is the you know the dynamical ejector, which happens you know very very quickly. Um, in this particular case, you know, you produce our process as the material decompress. And what matters here is how much mass and what's the velocity structure. And of course, the three dimensional structure of that matters too. Uh, you get expansion and nuclear heating of the outflow. So these basically both particles and photons are trapped. So they're heating and not allowing adiabatic cooling to proceed effectively until you get to a few AU where you know the time the expansion time scale is comparable to the diffusion time scale and the photons start to escape you know? and that more broadly speaking gives you a, kind of an intuition of how these light curves are made okay so something that it was incredibly important to to come up with was really trying to understand you know, what was the heating rate you know how much energy per unit time is basically injected into the into the remnant this is sort of the standard or net model from a radiation dominated compact but also you have, of course, adiabatic cooling. The first term is basically depleting your energy content. Radiation is also depleting the energy content by diffusion. And then you have the heating rate. And something that was actually predicted by Lee and Pachinsky was that you have so many elements at a particular time that are decaying that it was likely that the heating rate was going to be a power law. And this is one of the calculations, uh, early calculations done by Luke Roberts uh, and you know Brian Metzger did uh, similar calculations at, at about the same time. And, and what Luke shows there is basically the contribution of a particular nuclei as a function of time. And as you can see, you know, an element basically contributes you know, at a wide range of time scales. And what was incredibly important about this is that we, you know, at zero order, you expect the bolometric luminosity to follow the heating rate. So uh, that was sort of the first clue to try to understand, you know, are these systems processed by our process uh, decay or not? So I wanted to highlight here uh, the radioactive heating in the solar system and particularly on Earth, uh, because it kind of bears similarities here that you can see that the heating rate in the core of the Earth, you know, actually depends broadly on a broad range of different radioactive nuclei. Uh, something that is actually quite interesting is that at late times, uh, uranium and thorium actually have a very, very strong contribution in the heating rate of the Earth. Uh, so for example, uh, if you're interested, we just put a paper together talking a little bit about how radioactive elements are crucial to habitability. And we make the point that if you have huge amount of radioactive heating, as you see there in the top panel, you may have a string volcanism and maybe the dynamo would not be effective. So therefore you will not be able to have a magnetic field, which as you know, is essential for habitability. While if you have less radiogenic heating, you know, you're kind of more geologically dead, you have no volcanism. And just to give you a feeling, even at solar metallicity, observationally, there's a factor of two or three in the, in the content of europium from star to star. So it seems that, you know, that that may actually play a role in determining the interior heating of the Earth, which is interesting. Okay, so these are these are the sort of models just to give you an intuition of how these lockers are constructed. Uh, if you know type one A supernova models, as you know, are produced by the decay of nickel to cobalt to iron, uh, and then what you show there is basically uh, the dashed line is the radioactive heating. Again, you're completely opaque. You're diffusing outwards when the expansion time scale is comparable to the diffusion time scale. You get a peak, and then you follow the decay. And then the kilonova models there, which have significantly less material, so the heating rate is smaller, but also the heating rate per unit mass is smaller. Uh, it's highlighted there. And the hope was that looking at the likers emanating from the systems, we were actually going to be able to say something about what the heating rate was. Uh, just a historical note, these are called kilonova because they're about a thousand times brighter than a nova, uh, about 10 to the 41. We're predicting to be uh, at 10 to the 41 uh, ergs per second. So something that has been incredibly important in the field, and this is work that has been led by Dan Kaysen at the University of California, Berkeley, is really trying to understand what the opacity of these R process elements are. Now you have a basically ejecta that is primarily made of, of, of R process, uh, what is the opacity to you know to the radiation and and 
what he finds is, of course, that the valence electrons and the complexity, the many ways in which you can arrange the valence electrons drastically determines the opacity with the F, F, you know, the F shell nuclei there, particularly the lantanides and actinides series being the ones that contribute with the majority of the opacity. And here you're thinking about these systems having 10 million or so, you know, particular lines that will make the material, you know, drastically opaque. So the, these, these uh, lantanides actually, which are these F shell, which have significant amount of you know, atomic complexity lie between the second and third peak, you know, where we actually think that, at least observationally, we find that the, that the pattern is extremely robust. And here we show the opacity for you know, calculating in a statistical fashion by, that, by, by then, uh, in which it shows the difference between having F shell and D shell. For example, iron two, there is a D shell element. So as a result, it was predicted that these elements we're going to be incredibly opaque, uh, or you know, to light in to, to blue light, and the material would not, you know, will be only able to escape in the infrared. So, these were basically, if you had lantanides, it was predicted that it was going to be the the light was going to be incredibly red. So this is the type of uh, calculations uh, led by Dan, where you basically change the lantanide fraction of the material. Uh, and what you clearly see is the drastic shift of the light to the infrared. You know, the more of these lanthanides you have, the more red component you have. And these are, of course, the calculations made in advance of the observations. Um, so this is model spectrum relatively close to peak. Yeah. So this was basically the expectations. Uh, Another important thing to just highlight is that you're also sensitive to the bulk velocity because the bulk velocity really stretches, you know, these line features. And it's, it's important to highlight here that, you know, we don't know every single oscillation strength of all these nuclei with all the energies. And these are basically calculated statistically. So you cannot, you know, identify that particular feature with a particular element in particular in that case. But what you see if you were to take a sort of cross-correlation of the spectrum, the broadness will tell you something about, about the bulk velocity expansion, which is interesting. Okay, so, so what, what did we learn um, based on, on that background in August 17, 2017? As you know, uh, LIGO detected this beautiful uh, gravitational wave event. We got incredibly lucky being it close enough and the position uncertainty being uh, very, very accurate in the sky. Uh, I was also incredibly lucky to be part of these one meter two hemisphere uh, collaboration led by Ryan Foley, where we had, you know, very close to where I am right now, in Lake Observatory, a one meter telescope, and the Swope Telescope in Chile, a one meter. And um, this is the UC Santa Cruz team. Um, I think a lot of praise have to be uh, given to David Coulter, who basically designed the algorithm to, you know, rather than just blindly look for you know all the area available in the sky. He basically targeted the galaxies and had an algorithm to basically maximize the number of pointings or minimize the number of pointings, maximize the number of galaxies. And and thanks to him, you know, uh, Ryan's group uh, or group was the first one to detect the electromagnetic transient. And it's also uh, incredibly exciting that I am the oldest person there, and the group is incredibly diverse and and incredibly early career, which is exciting. Um, a lot of the follow-up, I think, uh, was, was done by Maria Drought, and, and she has a few really beautiful papers about this. Uh, but what we saw is initially the transient was incredibly blue. Uh, and then, you know, as predicted, it turned incredibly red, as you can see there. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we learned from the spectra. And, you know, there's, there's a, there's significant amount of science results that have come to, you know, as a result of this detection, and a, a lot of that, where you are, uh, you know, has been the center for, for, for leading the intellectual contributions of this. So I won't focus on that, but uh, here I really wanted just to talk about the evidence for cosmic creation of heavy elements via neutral capture in these systems. Uh, so what did we learn? So the first thing to realize is is the you know, can we basically uncover the total heating rate? Is the total volumetric luminosity follow the heating rate? And you know, overall it does. Uh, you get a minimum mass of about 0.02 solar masses, just solely based on the heating rate, uh, based on, on, on what we expect. Of course, thermalization and how effective we are at thermalizing uh, the energy 
you know, basically tells us that probably there's a factor of three or so more mass that was produced. There are significant corrections that go into trying to uncover the volumetric luminosity, particularly at late times. And at late times, you also don't know what the leakage of the energy is and how far you're deviating from the from the you know total volumetric luminosity. But interestingly enough, the you know to to zero order, it sort of followed the predictions that that was expected. Uh, you know the assumed LIGO, LIGO rate for this event is about 25 mergers per mega year. So again, these 10 to the minus five per year per galaxy. Uh, the estimates for this event show a total R process mass of about 0.06 uh, per event. And if you multiply that over the history of the Milky Way, uh, you get you know, a cumulative mass of R process ejected from all past events over the galactic history of about 10,000 solar masses. Um, the, you know, different, it, it's difficult to actually calculate the total amount of mass in stars, but it's, it's smaller than 10,000 solar masses. And there's an argument as to what fraction of that material that goes into the gas phase ultimately turns into stars. But at zero order, you know, neutron star mergers are a, at least a viable mechanism to produce the vast majority of the R process, even though at low metallicities in the early universe, it remains a lot of discussion as to whether or not they can do it effectively. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we saw, you know, we were able to fit this with a two component model, one that was very blue, as you saw early on, that had almost no lantadines, and then one that had significant amount of lantadines, actually a fraction of lantadines that is actually similar to in agreement with the robustness of the second and third peak, uh, which gives you the red component. Uh, and you know, the most remarkable thing in my view is that, you know, these models were of course made in advance of the observations and they seem to broadly, you know, give you the characteristics of the future, particularly knowing all our ignorance about the atomic data. It's kind of surprising that these statistical models seem to capture the main features of the spectrum. Um, so if you believe that, you know, the, the heating rate alone, I think doesn't really tell you the heavy R process, but the fact that the system became so red at late times, you know, that can only be done by the presence of lantadines, which lead between the second and third peak. And therefore, I think there's there's some robustness that we think that this event did produce, you know, second and, th and third peak, uh, the heavy R process element. So this is um, sort of the model uh, in general, we have a blue component. Uh, this is of course a 1D model, but a 3D representation. And then, a, you know, kind of a red, more massive component that follow. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the first component. There's still significant amount of debate and can still be consistent with the thermal component. Uh, but it may be that you only produce uh, kind of first peak elements that are really, really blue early on. And then you had the, the, the second component, which could produce by the tidal tails or the disk. And I think uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, or I just mentioned it. Uh, but in general, I think there's there's different sides to produce the R process. The tidal tail ejecta that I talked about, you know, has you know lots of really appealing features. It's incredibly neutron rich. Uh, it's not irradiated by neutrinos, but it seems that it cannot produce the mass that we saw. So I think most people now converge that it's unlikely that the tidal ejecta contributed a significant amount of mass of the kilonova. I decided to concentrate on that because it's the easiest one to follow. Uh, and to sort of isolate given that the neutrino contribution is not strong. There's this component, what it's called the squeeze polar ejecta where the two objects come together. This material actually expands very, very fast and the process is actually you know, quenched. So you expect to only have the first peak and be very blue. Maybe that's what we saw for the first component, that squeeze component. But I think the general belief is that the disk wind ejecta uh, you know, after the object collapsed into a black hole is what actually supplied the vast majority of, of, of the R process contribution there. And, and uh, there's, there's lots of really beautiful work uh, that uh, Rodrigo has done here and uh, recently Lee and, and Siegel. But, you know, there the, really the role of the neutrinos have to be taken into account and, and it becomes incredibly sensitive uh, to produce the the robustness of the spectrum, but we're getting there, I think, as a community, uh, getting more sophisticated calculations of the disk wind ejecta. But I think there's there's convergence in the field that the tidal tail is, is probably just not enough to 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 uh, you know to be assigned the vast majority of what we saw. 
Um, so there's of course a lot of very interesting, I didn't have time to talk about, about the non-thermal emission and the fact that these objects produce a relativistic jet. I think most of us think that the relativistic jet seems like a fairly standard short gamma ray burst pointing away from us. Uh, I think most people agree that you likely collapse to a black hole. Um, the neutron star mergers produce heavy elements. Well, at least we have one example at higher metallicity environments where we clearly see that they are contributing. They can, in principle, by rate and mass, contribute with all heavy R process elements, but there's some debate as to whether they can do it at low metallicity. Was the fate of the merger remnant? I think most people do believe that it collapsed to a black hole. Uh, I think a supermassive neutron star seemed to be rolled out, just energetically speaking. And, and of course, we're eagerly awaiting you know, a better position on location, which of course is going to have to wait until LIGO turns back on. Uh, but what we know is particularly these things are, you know, are um, closely related with short gamma ray burst is that at least the luminosity function of kilo nova is, is you know, varies from event to event. I think that's, that's something that, that I think we're converging just by analyzing short gamma ray burst. And you know, if they would have had an event like this one, we should have seen it and we haven't. So there seems to be you know, large variations from event to event. And, and you know, we, of course we have one right now with, with clear constraints, but, but the inference that we have is that there's large variations and I'll stop there. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, so uh, if folks have questions, you can either uh, raise your hand in the, um, the chat or uh, just uh, speak up. And in addition to questions, there's also, um, I'm not sure, Dennis, uh, do you want to, to speak up? I, I think there might've been a small typo on one of your slides, Enrico, if, the, if Jet Dennis is correct. Yeah, the 26. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's just it. It, I, I think it should be properly called the iron nickel peak because nickel peak, yeah. yeah, nickel. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, it it's it could be just notation, right? Astronomers call iron and nickel the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I should call it the iron peak. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, do folks here? I'll, I guess I'll start off with the first question. Um, so, um, in one of your slides, you came up with a really nice argument to rule out um, just a supernova as the main contributor to um, our process elements. Um, but I think that basically your argument, if I'm correct, is that if this was the main driver of supernova elements, that you'd actually see too much our process elements in the universe. Is that correct? A little. No, like it will be really difficult to enrich stars with something that produces so little per, per unit uh, mass. You know, because by the time okay. you cool, you know, you basically took that amount of mass and spread it over a mass of hydrogen that is way too large. So your, you know, you're rocking over hydrogen, you know, will never get to the excess that you get. So what you need is, you know, high event, you know, high mass per event. Okay. Okay. All right. So the. It's a minimum mass argument, no? Okay. Yeah. 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 Because of so, course the arg you know the argument that you can turn that into stars, you know as quickly as you start cooling is is probably as fast as you can do it, and you probably have to sweep significantly more hydrogen before you can do it. So that's that's okay. that's where the minimum mass argument comes from. Okay. Wonderful. Oh, it looks like we uh, have a number of questions now. So I I think uh, all let's see here. Almod might have been the first one to um, raise his hand. So I'll go with Almod first. So. I was wondering about the um, distribution of enrichment of, of heavy elements in stars. So if you look at the distribution, um, is it more like a levy flight? Is it more like a, is it more like a random walk if you look, or is it just dependent depend on the age? Um, can you see something more about the, about the statistical distribution of, of uh, heavy elements in, in different stars? Yeah, I, the connection was not, Perfect, but let, let me try to reinterpret what you said. Uh, you were asking about what do we know about the R process content in stars as a function of age and metallicity, for, for example. Uh, <clears throat> some, something that one has to always be careful, and this is, I think, where a significant amount of discussion is currently taking place about the enrichment of the Milky Way, is that, you know, of course, you're, you're mixing these elements in a kind of turbulent mixing way. And you know the sound crossing time across the Milky Way disk is you know a giga year or something or hundreds of mega years. So, 
uh, early on in the universe, it's hard to assign just metallicity with time. Uh, but later on, I think it's, it's, it's a better proxy for time. Uh, there are some uh, stars in which we can age them based on the uranium decay. So similar to what we do with carbon decay uh, on Earth, we can do uranium decay. And, and those are, you know, you know, as old as the, old, as, as the universe is within, within the errors. Um, what, what you're basically alluding to is, I think, that the amount of mass you know, in stars locked up in the R process seems to vary dramatically, almost to a factor of hundreds or so from star to stars that have the same iron abundance. Uh, but the abundance patterns seem to be very robust. So the, the ratio between elements seems to be you know, rather robust and, and highly representative of the, of the R process uh, pattern. Um, maybe that's what you were alluding to? Yeah, I was just trying to gauge whether you're more sensitive to the uh, to the closest event that happened close to where the star was formed, or is it just get does it get equal contribution from all parts of the galaxy? Yeah, yeah. So I think you know in this in the hydrodynamical simulations, cosmological simulations that have been done in this case, uh, you know, material early on, you know, you transition. I think depending on the simulation, but you transition from single enrichment to multiple enrichments. For example, for core collapse supernova, you know, in, in metallicities of like minus three, but for our process, you know, in metallicities of minus two in iron. So the single event is, you know, once, you know, if you have a star that it's, uh, whose iron metallicity is lower than minus two, it seems to be that the single event enrichment seems to be the dominant one. And then after that, the, the mixing starts being effective. And of course, today, uh, you're basically the integral of all the hard process that have contribute into the into the into the Milky Way. What it's interesting is if you have a supernova explosion in today's Milky Way, by the time you get to the cooling mass, uh, you don't get any excess metallicity contribution, say from iron or anything like that. No, because it's just an epsilon contribution. But for for neutron star mergers, you still do, because the mass per event is so high that you can still get significant local inhomogeneities. And there's some arguments that people have made looking at sedimentation in the ocean, you know, where they actually see different uranium abundance as a function of depth, thinking that, you know, as the solar system is sweeping the ISM and somehow these are process elements getting to the dust phase and make it through the, through the magnetosphere, you know, they're basically sedimenting and the sedimentation seem to show, you know, that still in the ISM, there's variations of, of our process elements in the gas phase. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Something, I think the most remarkable observation to me of our process, it's in, in M15 in globular clusters, where we know that in this particular case, they came from glass, you know, a gas cloud that was probably 10 parsec in size. And we see within the cluster variations of about, you know, a factor of 50 in our process. So it seems like even at the time where, where these objects were forming, you still have variations, while other elements are more better, you know, are, are much more efficiently mixed. Okay, okay thank you. That's also my answer to my question. Um, I think uh, Julio Navarro, um, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yeah, yes, it is. Uh, thanks. Um, and thanks, Enrico, for the wonderful talk. I was just wondering, you know, Going actually on piggybacking on on your last comments on the global clusters. So imagine you go now very very metal poor in the global cluster regime. Do you expect something different? Like imagine you had a you know nature present you with an opportunity to measure global cluster, say iron ten to minus four or something. Would you expect anything different? Would you expect this you know, mixing to be better? Do you expect any any or just expect the you know the the, very, the variance to be quite large in the R process elements there. Yeah, so there, there, yeah, so there's a significant amount of, de of debate right now, I think, of whether or not these neutron star mergers can enrich, you know, that early in the universe just because they take hundreds of mega years to, to merge and whether, you know, you require a kind of a special, unusual type of core collapse supernova to enrich that follows the star formation, right? So something uh, actually that Denis Idiarski <laughs> point out to me is if you take the current globular clusters, uh, the vast majority of them have our process abundances and you, you know, you, you put them in the, in the 
you know, in the spread of the abundance of the halo stars, you know, they're spreading in our processes similar to that that you have in the halo stars. And so some argument is, you know, only about 1% of all low metallicity stars are enriched in our process to a limit that we can see. So, you know, some people say, well, are those halo stars the result of kind of the fail, uh, you know, the, the star formation that did not become clusters uh, that were basically slower mass, maybe less efficient or not? That's one argument. Then there's some beautiful work by Ian Roder showing that taking a sample uh, of our process stars, he finds that they're actually counter rotating with the disk. So he thinks that they actually came from satellites that were not actually formed within the Milky Way. So then there's also this argument as to whether there were XC2 versus in C2. Um, we don't know. There's something that it's incredibly interesting based on the question that you ask is we see an incredibly fast drop at metallicities below minus 3.5. We don't see any R process enrichment below a metallicity of minus 3, you know, 3.5. And that's also where we see a very strong sharp in the number of clusters. Uh, I mean, of course, the number of statistics is not not great, but but it's intriguing, yeah, that we haven't seen global clusters form at much lower metallicity and also stars with our process at lower metallicity than minus 3.2, 3.3. Well, they may have been dissolved, right? They may have been stripped in the tidal field of the galaxy. I think they found very, very early on. But I mean, they may be they may be more difficult to detect. So issues of completeness, I think you write in these stars is, is, is complex. Yeah, I guess I was just wondering whether there's any like neat prediction one can make. Imagine I have a global cluster, 10 to minus four and iron, just to make it as, you know, as, as different from the data that we have today is, is there any prediction that one can say, okay, it has to, you know, are enriching our process or, or not, or, maybe, or maybe should, the, should patterns be the same or? The... Maybe the argument would be, if you, if you look at the ultra faint dwarfs, you know, and you take 12 of those ultra faint dwarfs, only one, which is reticulum two, is actually enriched with our process. Now, you're getting there to stellar masses that are of order 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 solar masses, no? And with a rate of 10 to the minus 5 per year per galaxy, it means that, you know, you're there in which, you know, you may be likely to get only one of these events versus none, no? And maybe you're getting to the stellar mass where large RMS variations in terms of occurrence takes place. Um, and, but be, I mean, I think beyond that, it seems like at least for the heavy R process, also in these ultra faint dwarfs, it seems like the second to third peak seems to also to be incredibly robust there. Thank you very much. And then uh, last question from Rodrigo. Yeah, Rico, I wanted to go back to that uh, result you showed about the liquid cores in rocky planets and radioactive heating. Uh, and so maybe I misunderstood. You said there was a variation of a factor of two in abundances and heating rates. So I was wondering whether is it that sensitive, the fact that we have a liquid core to the, having the just amount of our process abundance, or is there more scattering out there? Yeah, so the... The, the calculations that Francis Nemo did, you know, and of course these are simple calculations in 1D in trying to uh, understand, you know, the, the convection, you know, and what is basically the, the, you know, overturn time scale that carries most of the energy based on the heating rate as a function of time, uh, using this paper a factor of three uh, difference between, and the factor of three difference was, was pretty dramatic uh, in terms of, of, of of what it did to the convection. There's still a lot of uncertainties in those models, uh, but it seems that at least if you just change the heating rate by a factor of three, yes, it seems like the implications for, for the strength of the convection and the depth of the convection were, were pretty evident in those models, which of course have been, um, you know, uh, tailored to the, to the solar system. Okay, thanks. All right, um, so I think uh, that's technically the end of the formal seminar, but uh, now we're just going to slide into the more informal kind of question and answer session. So if folks have uh, something to, to go to, feel free to head off, but now um, feel free to speak up if you want to uh, just chit chat on whenever. So I'll stop recording.